Hello everybody. My name is Hartmut Geier and I have the honor today to introduce our seminar speaker, Andy Mieveler. He is the uh, Leinon Professor of Biology of Harvard University and also the director of the Concord Field Station. His expertise is in biomechanics and neuromuscular control of animal locomotion, primarily in the area of legged locomotion as well as area locomotion. And I think the first time you met was about 10 years ago at a biology and biomechanics meeting. And it was always fascinating to talk with him. We kept in contact loosely and also collaborated loosely a little bit. And it's just fascinating to have him here and present today. So please welcome our speaker. Uh, well, thank you, Hartmut, and I, this is, was a great opportunity to come. I, you know, this is really an impressive community you have here. It's, I can see why uh, he's very excited to be here, and uh, I have followed Hartmut's work. I've been very interested in his dynamic models, um, explaining issues of you know, walking versus running mechanics that are you know, more emblematic of legged locomotion that sort of grew out of spring mass models. And, uh, my own work really has been more, less on the modeling side, a more experimental approach to understanding uh, biomechanics of whole body motion as well as the neuromuscular control and how those movements are powered. So I'm going to uh, cover a range of topics. We're going to start off with covering some of the underlying neuromechanical uh, studies that we've looked at in terms of assessing the dynamics of muscle function related to uh, posture and, and stability during running locomotion using guinea fowls as an experimental model. And then I'm going to talk about some of the experiments that I had the opportunity to do uh, on largely go uh, goats and dogs, but also some of the work on the guinea fowl sort of helped to inform what we like to think the guidance of some of the design uh, el development of uh, Big Dog with Mark Rabert uh, through a DARPA biodynamics program that we worked on for five years together. And then we'll uh, move on to finish up with the work we're currently doing um, on an ONR Murray project with a large group at MIT, but also Drew Bagnell here in CMU and uh, people at NYU um, that uh, looks at trying to understand how birds navigate through cluttered environments so that develop more robustly autonomous uh, uh, vehicle flight through uh, uh, cluttered environments. So I'm going to move pretty quickly because it's a lot of topics and I don't want to stay, uh, keep you too long. Uh, but this is the Concord Field Station back in the early 1960s. It was a Nike missile facility developed by the Army, taken over, bought, or taken over from private landowners. That system was just short anti-aircraft, went defunct in the early 60s, gave it back to the family. Harvard was looking for a field research lab, and they were able to buy it from the family. 65 acres of land. This is where our main lab facility is. This is where I'll show you where we're doing some of the pigeon cluttered flight trials in a flight area here, and then we have a now building over here, which, which is where the wind tunnel, we, we fly birds in wind tunnels. But it does show that there were surface mounted missiles uh, on site. I don't think any of them were fired, but um, this was, we got this on an aerial JPEG that was just on, available on the web. Uh, an Army Corps of Engineer historian came by and I asked him, were there ever missiles deployed on the site? He said, I don't know. The Army's good at keeping secrets. So he didn't even know, and that was just a few years ago. We have exotic animals there that are transplanted to North America from Africa, guinea fowl, which is our model species for running, but I did have a, a student study uh, emu growth and looking at the skeletal biomechanics of that. And they seem to do pretty well in a wintry environment. So I forgot to change over this, but the, the point is that animals moving through natural surroundings actually have to compensate for uh, the ability to deal with variation in the substrate conditions and clutter in the environment. Um, and so it requires maneuvering and stability or control of center of mass motion, this energy state of the center of mass through time, either being perturbed or being able to maneuver and avoid obstacles. And the kinds of questions we're interested in addressing are how muscles are used both in flight and in terrestrial locomotion, what are the underlying dynamics of contractual patterns that, with time varying requirements for force and length con uh, and, and work output. So and that relates to how animals power movement, what are the power requirements for flight, how are muscles used to power movements of animals on the ground in leg locomotion, and how does that relate to their control? And then for this talk, and in general, we're interested in implications for designing more robustly stable and biologically inspired robots. So the thematic approach to the lab has been uh, to sort of take an integrative approach to locomotor biomechanics, looking at both steady and non-steady locomotion. 
And moving down this organizational chain of function at the whole body dynamics level and considering and controlling center of mass motion related to kinetic and potential energy and moments about the center of mass, and that's ultimately what the overall requirements for control of limbs or wings has to do is to control the energy state of the center of mass of the animal or the robot as it's moving. Uh, this is not dealing with perceptual tasks of trying to get through clutter, but this simply stabilizing motion. We could think of this as both in steady state or non-steady conditions. We were interested in what the underlying joint mechanics are and uh, underlying how different joints produce uh, energy, uh, provide energy return or absorb energy for facilitating control of the whole body dynamics. And then uh, focusing on the underlying particular muscles where we can measure their function understanding muscle tendon dynamics uh, related to that. And then ultimately, we've been recently working with rats where we can do in vitro muscle ergometry to try to look at muscle properties building up into this. But I'm not going to talk about this, this work today. So the outline of the talk, as I said at the outset, is that we're going to start off looking at the work we do to try to assess in vivo muscle function related to joint and center mass mechanics. And I want to move so I'm not going to block everybody's view from back over there. Um, and then we'll move to some of the goat and dog experiments we did for guiding uh, the development of big dog through the years, uh, finishing with measurements of center of pressure, ground reaction force, and center of mass torques through time. And then we'll turn to the maneuvering and turning flight studies of pigeons. So the work on um, what I'm going to focus on is the terrestrial mechanics and control for perturbations um, was the work of Monica Daly, uh, who was a graduate student, did her PhD with me. She's now at the Royal Veterinary College as a, a senior lecturer there. And uh, what we, this was stimulated by, some of you may know the work that Bob Full did years ago with a cockroach that had a little can on its back, the lateral per impulsive perturbation destabilized the cockroach, and you're interested in understanding the basically passive dynamics that would pro provide stabilization. Uh, other people have run animals over, and humans as well, over variable and uncertain compliant substrates to look at how the body reacts to changes in substrate compliance. So in our very simple crude approach, what we did was we had guinea fowl run down a runway that was solid, and then at random periods after we felt that they were not expecting it, we would replace this panel here with a piece of white tissue paper to match the uh, plywood platform, and the animal would run down, break through the tissue paper, see a a perturbation of, of a, a drop in its a center of mass potential energy state and looking at how they stabilize both in terms of center of mass dynamics as well as then we could go in and look at the muscles controlling movement at the distal part of the limb, the gastric nemius and a digital flexor muscle to see how the muscles operated to control this. So what I'll do is play this movie. You'll see now the bird running across the runway, it's about a 40% of hip height drop, eight and a half centimeters. That happens to be the thickness of a two by four. So it's a very simple uh, design. And let's see, I can make that runway. But you can see that the bird does a very good job of, uh, should be, whoops, uh, running along and stabilizing. And I think out of five birds and something like 70 trials, we only had one bird that really showed any trip and uh, fall. So that was a very stable strategy. We found that there were two critical conditions for stabilization. The initial limb contact angle as the animal contacted the lower substrate of the force platform here and the relative extension of the limbs depending on where the animal's position of the hip was. There is obviously variation as the, the stride period as to where it landed. So intrinsically perturbation studies are, are variable and so one of the things we had to care we had to worry about was the variation in the in the response of the animal to try to understand how to study what are the general principles that emerge from that. This is an example of a bird that has, can see the step. And so the question is, does vision help a guinea fowl when it's uh, running along the ground? Now, this is not a normal uh, substrate for the bird. And step transitions aren't natural. So the bird is slowing down. And you can see that very consistently, it would stub its toes. It slowed down. It was really pretty um, you know, poor in its performance relative to the running dynamics of sort of passive stabilization or center mass stabilization that used. And uh, yeah, for IACUC reasons, you, not many of you study animals, but those of you do know that uh, how you treat your animals and how you induce them to run is a concern, so we use the broom approach here. Uh, and this is just simply kinematic representation of the limb. They basically had a much more folded trajectory of posture. They landed with a more angled, you know, lower contact angle, and they basically used the, the limb to slow down. And they didn't really sustain their forward, you know, in terms of the overall kinetic potential energy of the center of mass very, uh, very well. So we 
developed three um, hypotheses for how they might stabilize. Uh, they're, they're running when they had this, this is as, as we were leading up to the experiments. How would they stabilize as they ran through, broke through this perturbation and suddenly fell in a hole? And this is, we thought this is relevant to what animals have to do, humans included, running in natural environments where there might be leaf litter and you fall in a hole. Uh, so the running limb is well characterized by a spring mass model uh, where the limb achieves spring-like function in supporting a point mass of the body on the limb. And so these spring mass models have been well characterized for legged locomotion in, in running. In fact, Hartmut's work shows that actually they apply well to walking, which is nice because there is elastic properties of the limb and compliance of the limb um, in walking as well as running. So we imagine the animal might simply extend the limb but able to maintain a similar characteristic spring stiffness of the limb to allow it to maintain the same center of mass dynamics as it fell in the hole as opposed to where it was running at this elevation and accommodating the height change by a more extended limb but with control of limb function, I mean muscle function in the limb could achieve the same spring like stiffness characteristics of the limb. The second case would be that the animal actually just fell in the hole and the loss in potential, or the potential loss in potential energy is converted into forward kinetic energy and the animal would stabilize by speeding up. The third possibility was that the animal would fall in the hole and absorb the potential energy and dissipate it by muscle uh, actuation of just simply absorb the, the, and it would lose some of its energy by the, the, the loss and it would have to be then produced in posit the next stride or two by uh, positive uh, energy production and actuation to get itself back up and regain its potential energy. And we found, without going through the details of all the results, that two-thirds of the strategies, the birds simply sped up to, to stabilize. So it's sort of a, it's easy stabilization strategy was simply to speed up and then they would slow down again as they came up over that second step. Now, we had a hard time training them to run consistently and maintaining a steady steady velo forward velocity from here to here. So they often would tend to slow down even more, but they would uh, slow down more so than what you might expect because they're converting kinetic energy back into potential energy to get up over, the, over this step. About the other third of the trials, they absorbed the energy. And again, those strategies seem to relate to whether the animals had a relatively more uh, inclined uh, limb contact angle and relative limb extension dictated which of the two strategies they tended to use. So it looks like there's intrinsic mechanics that can help stabilize the animal without actually having to have a lot of feedback control. Um, and Monica actually, I don't think this is work published, but used a spring mass model to show that um, this, a simple spring mass model will self-stabilize with this. And it does the same thing. It's, it basically converts the loss and potential energy into forward kinetic energy. Here, so here's the spring mass bouncing along changing kinetic energy um, in the horizontal direction. This is the, obviously the, uh, the aerial phase. And then as it goes down the perturbed step, it um, has a larger drop in, in, uh, in negative kinetic, in the kinetic energy, but that rebounds up. And so over the next two bouncing cycles, it regains and achieves a higher kinetic energy um, in the forward direction, um, and, which accommodates this, this overall decrease in potential energy that's oscillating the, with the motion of the center of mass. So if we look at the underlying joint mechanics, so we get the kinematics and work out from inverse dynamics the uh, joint moments and look at the cumulative joint work through time, we found an interesting pattern between proximal to distal joints of the limb. The, the hip, so the three, these were our three modes, level running, this is the center mass mode where the animal absorbs the center mass energy, this is the, anim, the mode where the animal converts potential into kinetic energy to stabilize. Um, and we found that the time sequences are offset. We didn't normalize to 100% uh, of stance phase because these perturbation trials occur with shorter stance times. They occur over a shorter time period. But we've, overall, the pattern of work at the joints, at the hip and the knee, is, is, remains relatively constant. At the hip, the hip is always producing uh, work, uh, whereas the knee has no network production. Uh, and if you look at the change in work relative to normalized for, by limb work relative to level running, that's the yellow traces here, there's no significant difference at the hip or the knee. Uh, but there was significant variation at the ankle and the TMP. That's a joint in the foot similar to a you know, metacarpo, metatarsophalangeal joint um, in a human. And this, depending on the strategy, the ankle joint in a kinetic energy mode remained as, as, as a spring. It didn't get loaded as much. It didn't show the, the as much of a modulation of energy absorption and production, but in the energy absorbing mode, it actually functioned to absorb much of the energy of, this, of the body center mass due to the loss of potential energy. 
And similar, the TMP joint also operated differently. So in level running, it absorbs energy. In the center of mass energy absorbing state, it also absorbs energy. But in the uh, kinetic energy mode, it changes to more, the joint is more, has a more of a rotary spring function where it absorbs energy and then produces it again. And these are statistically distinct from the level running uh, condition. So there's variation within the limb um, as to what, how the animal responds to the perturbation. And we, we thought that these patterns suggest that these joints might be more under feed forward control where the nervous system is simply pr activating the muscles to produce work at the hip and can stabilize the knee with no net uh, work output, whereas the feedback from the ankle and the TMP joint uh, could pr provide um, changes in modulation of how those joints operate based on the, the activation and feedback to the muscles controlling work at those joints. Yeah. Do you want questions? Yeah, feel free to ask. Yeah. So another possible explanation is if the ankle corresponds to the knee in a human, mm -hmm. if that ankle goes straight, so you're singular, you're essentially now pole vaulting over that joint. And you don't, it doesn't matter what the brain's doing. You, because you're, you're singular, you're going to get those results. All right, but the ankle, the ankle does, it's more or less like a human ankle joint. So they have a so they have a, a knee joint. So the, the 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 geometry of the limb is not all that. I mean, it's not as erect as a human knee. Uh, they have a fairly flexed knee joint. In fact, birds, most a lot of the swing motion is occurring at the knee rather than the hip. Whereas in humans, the motion a lot of the motion is at the hip relative to the knee. But the ankle joint actually functions very similarly in an avian biped as it does in a human. So it's well away from single. Yes, it is. Yeah. So it goes through a flexion extension cycle, and it's the lower. For work is because the limb is more extended and it's and it's not it's not seeing the same the level of moment that it would in level running. Okay, so one of the things that we found was that the the changes in posture depending on whether the bird is landing in a, in the, the step or having to climb out of the step relative to level running, uh, were were tended to be correlated with the magnitude of uh, force that was produced. So this is the peak muscle force during stance. Um, this is in the, in the gastric nemius muscle, and the, um, um, the magnitude of work that would be produced. And so when the animal's falling down or going in a hole, it produces less stance work and produces lower muscle forces. Level running, this is all relative to, uh, to level. Uh, so the control work of control is level running. And then at the, where it's having to step up, it actually, not surprisingly, at the ankle joint is producing more work and producing a larger force to produce that work. So now what I'm going to do is, well, so we, we, the other approach we've taken is to create an obstacle treadmill. So we have a treadmill. So one of the problems with a run, runway trackway was that we had to, it's, it's hard to get the measurements of running birds down runways and over force plates and, and training them to be not expecting a perturbation breaking through tissue paper. So we decided to build an obstacle treadmill, which so this is a treadmill that has separate um, sections here that we can put obstacles of different geometries on. And the idea was to minimize the visual pr processing and look at sort of the passive response and, and local feedback control at the spinal level rather than visual perception influence in the behavior. So this shows, this will show you a, a guinea fowl running over an obstacle that's, these are uh, five centimeters high and so, and they're five in a row, so they're 25 centimeters long. And this is just a loop video. So you'll see that one of the things we found, guinea fowl have very, uh, you saw they, they often stub their toes over these step transitions. So not very good control of positioning limb positions. They often do stub their toes. We've even seen, seen the birds roll over their toe and walk on the tops of their toes as they come down off the, but they're very uh, stable and, and robust in this case. This is slowed down an eighth of normal speed. So this is what it looks like with a bird moving at regular speed at two meters a second on the treadmill. So we can look at, uh, so we looked at both the, the breakthrough uh, perturbation experiments as well as these step obstacle experiments. And what I'm going to show you now are the underlying measurements of muscle uh, dynamics based on in vivo recordings of muscle tendon force, which we use these force buckles, uh, which we put on the muscle's tendon. So we looked at the lateral gastric nemia, so it's very similar muscle in a human, the, the lateral calf muscle. Uh, and then a digital flexor muscle, an underlying muscle that controls motion of this digit here through a long tendon. Uh, and they're both pinnate muscles, and so we, and we, then we can monitor length changes of the muscle dynamically from piezoelectric crystals. Here's some right up here. We use these two or one millimeter crystals relative to the American dime here. And so these are little crystals that are excited. They produce a high frequency sound pulse that's transmitted through the muscle. 
And one is a, a stimulating or a pinging crystal, sending the signal. The other one is the receive. And based on the velocity of sound in the muscle, which is about 1,540 meters per second, uh, we can calculate position, length between the two of them. They're aligned along the muscle's fiber. So as the muscle contracts, the time for tr tr you know, transmission of the ping one, one electrode to the other goes down. And that represents a shortening. And as they go further apart, the time for transmission goes up. And that's a lengthening. So we can look at length changes along with forces, and then we can put electrodes in the muscle, EMG electrodes, to measure the activation patterns of the muscles. And so this shows um, in vivo recordings of the muscles. While in dashed um, is the, the normal level running, uh, so this is the length change of the, of the gastric nemius. This is the force during stance and swing. Uh, this is the EMG of activation, representing the neuromuscular activation of the muscle. And then this, this, these set of recordings in green are the digital flexor. And then in blue, overlapping, are the uh, measurements made as the animal transitions over the obstacle. And you can see, just point out a couple of major points here. I don't want to go into too much detail on this, because I know most of you don't uh, think about muscle dynamics. But is that the muscle, we can see that the bird steps up. The limb is in a more crouched position. This stretches the muscle tendon unit. The gastric nemius doesn't shorten as much. It stays in a longer length. As it, and it also develops more force. So it may, it's recruited more, plus it's not able to shorten as much, and its shortening velocity initially is, is very low. So muscles, the force output of muscle depends on its recruitment, the magnitude of the stimulation of the muscle by the nervous system. It depends on the velocity of shortening, so the muscles that shorten more slowly generate more force. And it also changes, the length of the muscle also changes. Um, this is because of the properties of muscle depend on overlap between the proteins that produce the force. There's an optimal overlap where muscles can produce maximal force. So if this stretch is moving the muscle further up its plateau of its so-called length tension curve, it can produce more force. So this was evidence that there's intrinsic uh, dynamics of the way the muscle is generating force, or changing length and being activated that can influence this increased uh, force development. And it's important that the muscle is generating more force because the animal has to do, we saw previously when the bird steps up on a step up, the muscles have to do more work. So this extra force is able to increase the force that can do and, and overall the network that is produced goes up. The digital flexor is more complicated. In this case, it actually decreases. It doesn't have to produce as much force because it's not really functioning in this, this stride to do uh, work production for elevating the bird. So this will give you a sense of the time varying dynamic. So we've simply, we're going to show you the trial of the length change of the fascicle, which is in purple here. Hopefully this will show up for those in the back. Monica liked purple. These are some of her slides. And this is just simply a MATLAB script that's going to plot this. Here's the uh, muscle force pattern. This is, this is the level pattern, and this is the level EMG. And so we're now going to play this as the bird runs over the, uh, the uh, I think it's going to play. was playing earlier. Let me just, maybe I, maybe I, uh, maybe I, I, let's see if it's going to play here. No, neither one of these is going to play. Well, I guess I'm not going to get those to play. Oh, there we go. Well, this will show you one. Okay, so uh, I might not have, I, when I was re-putting this talk together, of course, uh, PowerPoint doesn't always locate the movies properly. So this is going to loop, so you'll see this a few times. So. What you can see, again, going up over the stride, this is that case where the muscle doesn't shorten as much, and it's able to produce more force. It's also the frequency of the, I mean, the EMG is activated uh, through time and modulated relative to normal. Um, and so this allows the muscle to produce more force, and overall, the, the work output of the muscle does go up. Um, it, um, it's certainly producing work at other muscles and joints, but um, you can see that the, there's intrinsic dynamics that are likely affecting the way in which the muscles, that are going to affect the force and work output of the muscle. And then sub, we think that these are provide immediate early on uh, intrinsic effects. Uh, Jerry Loeb at USC likes to call these preflexes. Um, but this allows then time for reflex modulation of the muscle force later in the stride. And we see evidence of that from the modulation of EMG. And we know that the reflex time is about 35 milliseconds for these um, animals, which is ta sufficient time for the animals to uh, modulate the force later in support. And this is a summary of some of those data for the lateral gastric nemius and digital flexor showing this is the uh, control level running, uh, the mean in 95% confidence intervals, patterns for length and force, 
and EMG act, integrated EMG activation. And these are three of these obstacle steps. So they're increasing force, shortening, reducing the shortening velocity and the length, and modulation of the EMG relative to the normal. And there's not much of a, there's, there's effects of length, but not a strong effect on, there's force timing characteristics that change. But the digital flexor is just a small lateral toe di, uh, flexor that doesn't really have that much to do with the actual, it's more probably for stabilization uh, relative to substrate conditions than it is for actually modulating uh, center of mass work. So just because I was talking to a few of you uh, earlier today, I got into studying muscle function in bird flight because birds have this large pectoralis, it's one large flight muscle. Uh, so we can use the same methods, sonar micrometry and EMGs, but we also then developed an approach for measuring forces of the muscle by uh, using a skeletal process where the muscle inserts. This acts as like a little cantilever and we can use that as a force transducer calibrating the strain output from the strain gauge, which is mounted onto the bone, uh, relative to a force. So this is a st simulation of the muscle producing a force, and you see the strain profile matches that faithfully. And so we can look at, characterize uh, force and length and work output of this flight muscle. And the appeal for bird flight, aside from birds being you know, fun to work with, and they don't bite you like a lot of uh, mammals do, although the parrots can, um, is that it's, this muscle is 15 to 20 percent uh, the, the two sides, 15 to 20 percent of the bird's mass, and so much of the flight requirements for power can be understood by studying this one muscle, whereas in legged locomotion there are multiple muscles and multiple joints, which makes it more complicated. And just to show you, yep, there we go, one pectoralis, 8 to 11 percent of body weight. And this is, these are data from a cockatiel flying in the wind tunnel, um, and so what this shows is one of the remarkable things we found was that the muscle undergoes strains in the range of about uh, 35 to 40 percent from maximum length to shortening at, at upstroke to short minimum length at uh, the end of shortening during downstroke. This is the EMG when the muscle is being turned on at the end of upstroke to downstroke. And this is, this is a downstroke muscle powering flight. And here's the uh, force. And we can then relate the uh, force relative to length change and, provide, and do then an in vivo work loop. And so the length pattern here relative to force in the area within this loop allows us to characterize the work output, and we can then, based on wing beat frequency, characterize power output. So um, anyways, we can do this in bird flight. Um, we've been trying to make some of these measurements to understand maneuvering and flight control, but um, that's been a more challenging topic. So let me move to part two, which is the uh, studies that we did um, that were motivated by working with uh, uh, Boston Dynamics and, and uh, Mark Rabert on big dog experiments. So one experiment, I mean, one of the things I was amused with, we went to one of the DARPA meetings and they said, well, we don't really need a fast dog. What we need is a mountain goat that can scramble up steep uh, slopes. And I said, well, we actually have goats. So we actually started studying goat locomotion along with dog locomotion. And one of the things we did was look at how goats scramble up uh, rocky surfaces like this. We have two force plates here. And I'll just show you the video of it. To, um, it was a fun experiment. We had no problem getting the, the goats to target the force plates and land on the force plates. Um, and somebody asked, well, is it hard to get the goats to do this? Well, it was actually harder getting them down than it was. Uh, <laughs> they were very happy to jump up uh, this, this rockway. So we built it out of cinder block and supported the force plates here. And we found that one of the things they did was they did a follow the leader targeting. So we think they are able to, the position control of the forelimbs guides the positions of the hind limbs, which is critical for rocky terrain where the substrate is very uneven. Um, they, they don't produce any force with the forelimbs on this uh, climbing uh, stride because they would, that would pitch them away from the, uh, so it really the forelimbs are really just guiding position. And most, most of the propulsion here is by increasing the uh, hindland propulsion is through increases in joint range of motion, which would come from increased uh, shortening strains of the muscles. So this was Big Dog 1, uh, and this was David Lee who was with a postdoc on the project at that time. Does anybody want to, I don't know how many of you have seen this picture of Big Dog 1, does anybody tell me what, what looks wrong with that robot? Exactly. The legs are pointing the wrong way. And, we, and this was not a very stable robot. And we, we said, well, David just published a paper in Proceedings of the Royal Society which actually modeled, I don't know if anybody uses working model anymore, but he did working model simulations of a quadruped with the legs pointed the right way versus he reversed both the elbow, the forelimb, and the knee and showed that the biasing, the normal biasing of the legs bend forward in, in, the, for, in the hind limbs and bent backward in the, in the forelimbs biases the ground reaction forces so that the forelimb acts as a braking set of limbs 
the hind limbs have a propulsive bias, which aligns the ground reaction forces closer to the center of mass of the animal, which reduces the pitching moments. And so we said, the first thing you need to do is simply reverse the knees so uh, they're, they're pointing forward. So that, and this, this, one of the problems with this robot was it had very, un, you know, had a lot of pitching moments, and so it was unstable. And so with that design, Big Dog 2, uh, they got the knees pointed the right way, started uh, operating much better. We, I didn't, I'm not going to show you the video, but we actually ran some goats over a rockway and showed how stable they were. And so uh, Mark and Martin Bueller at the time and Gabe Nelson decided, well, they better do this too. So they actually, in, a, in the industrial site, they had land to test the robot on. They moved it out. Now, I wanted to actually plug in. Well, actually, most of you probably have heard these videos, right? Seen them? Yeah, so it makes a lot of noise. Yep, not getting sound. There we go. So stealth was not one of the so stealth was not one of the goals of the, the robot design, and uh, nor was originally vision was going to be part of it, but that also didn't work out. So now uh, Gabe, um, I, I, I do say he was really a wonderful con uh, controls engineer, um, and he um, used a lot of the control of center mass torque control was implemented uh, using cruise controller that was originally developed for stick insects. And, and so I want to just, I'm, I'm sure that most of you have seen, let me just go to uh, this video. I just want to show you one section of the, uh, are we, no, we're not. Let me just go to view, I'll go here. So. This is, this is the robot after carrying packs and weights up a slope, and then it, now this is it. But this was one of the most impressive parts of the uh, performance, I thought, was the, the ability of the, of the robot to slip on ice and get back up. And I think the ability to control leg position and the moments produced to stabilize center mass moments was really pretty remarkable. So, the other thing that the design of the robot started out with the goal would be about 40 kilograms and it ended up being about 80 or 85 kilograms. That was just without the extra uh, uh, cargo load that it would carry. So anyways, I guess the sound is, gets dulled by the, uh, there. So anyways, that was, uh, so we were, so one of the questions that came up, let me just uh, pause this go back to PowerPoint. So one of the things that um, came up was, well, how do, what's the distribution of um, moments on the ground? Uh, well, actually, the other thing I, I wanted to say was we, David and I did a study where we were characterizing the, the role of different uh, joints. So we weren't really worrying about trying to create controlled muscle actuated um, uh, uh, propulsion in big dog. They used uh, hydraulics and uh, prismatic uh, actuators. Uh, for uh, producing the, the, the power requirements. But we were interested in characterizing where in, in the limb of a dog or a goat is, is work or power being produced and energy being absorbed or where is it acting uh, spring-like. And we found that the, the distal joints are where they become less work and more spring-like. And we actually found the metatarsophalangeal and even the metacarpal metacarpophalangeal are always dissipative joints. So one of the things we tried to ask them to implement in design, which they were very resistant to, was to build in compliance and dissipation, dissipative elements, uh, either actuation where you could have controlled dissipation or dissipating elements in the uh, limb. Uh, their response was dissipation's energy loss is always a problem, and so we're always losing energy, so we don't want to have to build dissipation into the robot. So they didn't, they, they didn't want to do that. We, we did develop better compliant feet, which improved the performance of the robot, but they were, you know, the, from their point of view, this was asking too much problem in terms of increasing the power requirements uh, for the robot as a whole. So they, they avoid dissipative elements here. So coming back to the slipping, one of the questions was where um, does the animal position the limbs? Um, I think I'm going to skip this. So this, this is just a summary of some of the design guidance that we had from um, animal locomotion studies, which I think I've probably made a, a pretty reasonable uh, point of as I've gone through this. Uh, so what we were interested in was characterizing, we realized people had looked at single limb forces, but in animal studies nobody had really looked at control of center of mass um, moments uh, through time and what the sum distribution of individual forces sum up to a, a center of pressure 
on the, in, on the animal and what that resulted in a net ground reaction force in a center mass moment. So we looked at trotting, which, in, which involves diagonal couplets or paired motion of a contralateral forelimb and hind limb, which move out of phase with respect to the uh, opposite side limbs. So this is a trotting dog or a trotting horse. It's very analogous to a running biped. But then with four limbs, animals uh, to move faster gallop. Uh, they reduce their duty cycle and they, they, they shift the phasing so that the four limbs act more or less in phase and the hind limbs are acting out of, out of phase with those but in phase with, with each other. A full bound would be where these are completely in phase and these are completely in phase but out of phase with each other. And they, then there are aerial phases between different periods of hind limb or four limb support. So we hypothesized that um, the center of mass moments in general by an animal would be kept small uh, by tracking the center of pressure and ground reaction force to the center of mass to keep the moment small. Uh, otherwise, you'd have this animal that's, that's, that's having to rock quite a bit and, and having its angular uh, inertia be moved around in pitch roll and yaw. With a, triangle, with a diagonal support of trotting, we expected higher center of mass pitch um, uh, so, sorry, uh, higher center mass roll than pitch, and we thought y'all would be insignificant. But in galloping, because of the asymmetry of fore limbs and hind limbs, we expected the center mass pitch moments to be much more uh, incre much increased and, and greater than that of roll. And again, y'all being relatively insignificant. We expected fore limbs to pitch the animal up because we the ground reaction force is acting in front of the center mass, and the hind limbs would pitch the head anim animal down, acting behind. And, and that, that was based on you know, the timing of galloping support. So what this is, this is work, we haven't published it. So there's an interesting side story to this. Um, so we've waited to publish this because I've been asking, uh, I asked Mark and Gabe Nelson if we could have the center, big dog data to compare to the goat and dog data. And we've been waiting over two years for that data. So one of the problems that I, I would say from an academic point of view, um, the, the, the information exchange flow tended to run, run from us to them. There was less coming from them. Uh, partly, they're a company, and they have intellectual property rights they wanted to protect. So we, had, we found we got very little data about how Big Dog actually performed relative to what we were supplying about goats and dogs. So, um, so a little frustrating. But what this is going to show is a simulation, or basically a, a representation of center pressure trajectory as the dog goes over, this is a trot going over our force plates. I apologize, we, we didn't take very uh, high quality videos in these experiments. Um, and then this is the center of mass trajectory. We're assuming it fixed, it doesn't stay in place there. It was just showing where we represented it on the torso of the animal. It's a, body, it's a fixed body uh, center of mass location based on other markers on the animal's trunk that we, so we didn't account for relative segment mass distribution changes. Um, and then the, ground, the net ground reaction force. So you can see that as the animal moves on the ground, the center of pressure along with the ground reaction force tracks center of uh, mass location really well. Uh, and I'll just run more, one more time through. And what we see is the largest moments are in pitch. That's white. And initially, there's a, uh, a pitch head down and then a pitch head up in trotting. And then a second diagonal phase, pitch head um, this is, at this point, it's, it's pitching its head down, and now it's pitch head up. The, the yaw moments are green. They're very small. And the uh, roll moments are smaller than pitch. So the, the support of what we expected was that the, the, the sub distribution of limb support and ground reaction force orientation relative to center of pressure and center mass location keeps the moments low. They're in the range of, for this dog, which is about 46 kilograms, or, um, 20 newton meters is the largest moments in pitch that we observed. So now this is a dog. We did this for goats, but I want to show you the data for dogs. If you want to see the goat data, I can show you this uh, later. But now this is a, the dog galloping, the same representation. So here the forelimbs are landing, acting in front of the center mass. So that's pr producing the, pet, the, the head up pitch. Okay, it starts off. And the two forelimbs are a little bit out of sync. You know, it's not a completely in phase. The limbs don't l completely land in phase. So there's a couple of biphasic peaks. But notice the pitch moments have now increased tenfold to 200 newton meters. Uh, and now the hind limbs act behind the center of mass and produce an opposite uh, head down pitch um, in, the, in the subsequent phase. So, uh, and roll moments and yaw moments are relatively small. So we were curious to know, okay, how does big dog compare, especially in trotting, because it mainly doesn't, it doesn't gallop. Uh, how, does it, how does it function in a trotting gait um, relative to the goats and dogs? So I can't tell you, I don't know. I, I suspect it's not as good, um, but, um, 
So one of the things Big Dog didn't have is a flexible back, and I think that's one of the things they're working on with the Cheetah robot, is to have a flexible uh, torso, which gives, reduces center of mass moments and uh, probably gives more economy to uh, center of mass motion, potential kinetic energy uh, state. Uh, what we found in the goats and dogs was that the dogs tended to produce much larger pitch moments than goats in galloping, but pitch, the, the pattern was generally the same, that both animals had larger pitch moments during trotting, but they're much smaller um, than they are during galloping. Um, and so these are, we normalize these because of the differences in the animal's body mass uh, for moment of inertia of the trunk as well as angular acceleration of measured of, of the trunk's rotations. So now I'm going to change to my uh, final part. And question. yeah, uh, is there a simple explanation why or for that gait change, or why galloping is a faster gait than trotting? I, it's because I think the animals can increase the um, range of motion of the limbs, yeah, and they can increase their stride length. They so generally quadrupeds increase stride frequency and stride length through trotting, and then once they transition into a gallop, they increase stride length, and stride frequency tends to remain relatively constant, and uh, Tom McMahon and Dick Taylor long ago argued this was sort of, you know, sort of based on resonant properties of the trunk as a whole and the, and the, and the, and the oscillating dynamics of the limb segments that gives a you know, minimum cost to oscillating the limbs in that fashion. So that's it. Now, big Dog doesn't run as fast as they wanted it to because the range of motion was, was limited. They couldn't extend the, uh, they couldn't actuate over such a broad, large strain range of the actuator. And, couldn't create as wide a range. And I think that probably also resulted in, although when the, when the robot was slipping, the ranges of motion are much more extreme than it was during steady state movement. So they're clearly, I was thinking it might be control limitations, but um, it, I'm not sure that they were concerned about that with larger ranges of motion, but I think it was more actuation and being able to produce the power in those, those ranges of motion. Any other questions? Okay, so let's, so, uh, Probably some of you have seen this before as well. So these are, uh, this is a goshawk. This is a BBC, part of a BBC uh, YouTube video showing the animal flying through a cluttered environment. This is what Russ Tiedrich was fascinated by at MIT. And so he put together this Murray team. And so we were one of the biology components to do bird flight studies to try to inform the better, you know, the, the improvement of the control for uh, more autonomous flight through a cluttered environment. And uh, so. We, don't, we haven't worked with goshawks. Uh, we've been working with pigeons. And I want to first start, we, we had been at the time this, we were approached, we were, Evo Ross was a graduate student in the lab, and Ty Hedrick was a previous student. We were doing, trying to simply understand how pigeons make 90 degree turns. And we had a symmetric flying course so we could compare, like this right side wing is the inside wing when the bird flies right, or when it comes back, it's the outside wing. And look at the idea, and we've been trying to work on this problem for about three, I had an NSF grant to study this, was, understanding kinematic asymmetries and underlying neuromuscular asymmetries that would result in the aerodynamic force asymmetries necessary to produce roll, pitch, and yaw of the bird's body to reorient its uh, new uh, flight bearing from this direction to this direction. So it has to produce uh, moments to change its flight path and overcome the centripetal uh, acceleration to go around that turn. And it, it turns out, the, the short answer, is that it's very hard to show this kinematically as well as underlying neuromuscular uh, properties because the birds are so maneuverable. There's, the roll moment of inertia is very low. The changes in either aerodynamic force asymmetry, either due to where the force is being produced on the wing or the magnitude is, is very small to produce the rates of roll acceleration we see, for example. So this is an example of a, of a pigeon flying through our course. We, we used up to eight cameras at one time. We had infrared tracking cameras as well as five high-speed light video cameras. And we marked the bird up and, and then filmed it and then compared the kinematic motions of the wings. And it's very hard. You think you see something, but it's very hard to actually see asymmetries. And yet the bird is making a turn. And it clearly is having to shift the orientation of its body through time relative to producing changes in aerodynamic force. So just in a nutshell, and this is a paper we published last, just this early part of this year in PNS, the result was the pigeons turn like helicopters. They use rotations of the body to reorient the uh, aerodynamic force vector. So this represents the vector cone of aerodynamic force over all wing beat cycles of straight flight, turning flight, and coming out of the turn during the downstroke, producing a force on the body in this orientation. You can see that the variation in force orientation and magnitude is very small uh, relative to the body. 
So to reorient the force and overcome centripetal acceleration as it's going around a turn, the birds have to roll into the turn, producing the necessary inward component to move the body um, around the turn. And we found that they also produce a, f a fairly characteristic uh, force during the upstroke. This was actually a surprise that they actually produce net useful lift in the upstroke. Um, and the way we achieved this was a very detailed mass distribution model of the bird. And these spheres represent the local masses of the body segments. We treated the wings, um, the tail, and the body as a single mass. And there's the head separately, though, but different parts of the wings. And so we accounted for time varying fluctuations of mass distribution of the bird through time um, to be able to compute the net aerodynamic force acting on the bird uh, by simply by subtracting out gravity uh, as the, the other acceleration acting on the bird. Um, and so this was um, one of the surprising results was we got what we expected in the bird producing um, aerodynamic force during, during downstroke to support body weight. But these are the patterns for the three pigeons, but and this is the average pattern for all three. We found that they also are able to flip back the wings and produce useful uh, lift support during upstroke. Um, and this actually isn't comparable to some of the lift support that's been measured in hummingbirds. Uh, so hummingbirds really, even though they look like they have a symmetric wing stroke, actually produce more two-thirds to three-quarters of their lift in downstroke and only a quarter to one-third in upstroke. So um, pigeons are actually able to achieve this in slow uh, flight, able to achieve some useful lift during the upstroke. So the birds were, this is to try to understand the aerodynamics and, me and mechanics of being able to make a turn. But one of the things we were, by getting involved in the Murray project, we noticed was we started being interested in the visual perception of how do the birds turn when they're making uh, uh, um, these, these turning maneuvers. And what we found was that the pigeons make these head saccades, angular saccades of the head. You can see that right there is one, there's another one, and there's another one. Um, and so the birds are turning and, and, take, and creating a new visual field. So this is a, involves optical, uh, optokinetic nystagmus, where we, in humans, we use our eyes and our head motion to control where we're looking. The eyes are relatively fixed in birds, so the way the birds do it is largely just rotate the head. And so if you've ever seen a pigeon walking along the ground, it bobs its head forward, and that provides, they have thrust and hold phases. It keeps, stabilizes gaze. And one of the ideas of why stabilization of gaze is important is then if you're moving, you can detel, detect your relative motion by your, your, your holding your, your position fixed, and you can tell the motion of objects past you gives you some sense of, of either, well, if you're not moving, you can see whether motion is, is, if there's potentially a threat of something that's moving in your environment, or you can judge relative motion control this way. So we're, we've been interested in understanding how the birds are tracking head motion. And one of the things we've found, this is just recent data that uh, Evo's analyzed, is we found that the birds seem to, that there's cor we have correlational evidence of this. The birds seem to d relate the deviation of their bearing, that is the direction that they're actually, the velocity vector in the horizontal frame, relative to where they're, where they're looking, which is the, the direction of visual uh, expansion of the, of the visual field. And there's a direct correlation with the changes in movement trajectory during a flight stroke with the degree to which this is deviating. That means the more the head deviates in one direction relative to the, uh, where they're looking relative to where they're headed, they'll actually change their flight trajectory more. There's a proportional control here of changes in flight trajectory. And this also is correlated with rotation of the, of the neck. So one of the things I don't have a video of, which I meant to uh, bring, was if you take a pigeon and you rotate its body very quickly, if you hold a pigeon and rotate its body very quickly, it holds its head perfectly still. So we've got tremendous control of the neck muscles to stabilize head position relative to the body. So our idea is, we, our hypothesis is that pigeons fly by controlling head position. And so by moving the head, that produces a stimulation to signal through the cervical musculature and proprioceptors how to rotate the body, to reorient the body, to change the aerodynamic force vector and rotate about the aerodynamic force to be able to produce these, these turns. And so what we're currently doing, these are experiments we just did, we've tried to create an artificial uh, field do I have, I think I have another, no, I guess I didn't. I took, might have taken it out. Of, and I'm, I'm afraid in this, you're not going to see it, but this is a circular cylinder, which we have video projectors, four video projectors on the outside, producing artificial surround flow. People have done this with insects, um, but never done it with flying birds. So we've got a pigeon flying vertically up through here. And this one, uh, Evo's actually holding the pigeon, and the head does show these saccades. And we're interested in during flight, not in a fixed held position, does the bird respond to this to try to stabilize the flow, this angular flow, uh, optical flows. And what we're expecting is the bird will 
turn as it flies up through the cylinder. So he's collected some of those data and he's currently looking at that. So returning to the final uh, phase of, of projects we actually did uh, for, for the Murray, building on the turning work that we were doing, is the realization that the, the natural environment has a lot of uh, clutter in it, a lot of vertical, um, we've really been focusing on vertical obstacles, so the trunks of trees. And so how do birds fly through that and get through that? So this is our artificial forest. Uh, this is work that Evo and YT was the postdoc at the time did. As we simply train the pigeons to fly from a starting perch to a landing perch, and they fly back and forth and they're trained to fly through this. And then we develop this pole array where we can randomize pole positions um, in a three by three area. And we can create a ca calibrate control volume where we can track kinematics of where pole position relative to pigeon position. And we can look at flight trajectories that the pigeons track and sort of look at navigational cues they may use to navigate through the poles and also for obstacle avoidance um, as, they, as they fly through. When we first did this, I wasn't sure we were even gonna get the pigeons to fly through, but they do. They're, they're very good at train, being trained. We'd like to eventually work with something like a hawk, but we're working with pigeons at this point. This is an early phase where we first set it up. We have can, uh, plastic sheeting on the sides to provide a relatively opaque and uniform lateral view. We have to create these uh, barriers at this height to keep the calibrated volume at the height where the camera, we have some depth. We can't go all the way down to the floor with our cameras. So here's the pigeon with uh, reflective markers. This is back when we were using reflective markers. We've now moved to active LED markers on the pigeon and we can mark the poles and know their locations. Here's the active markers on the head and body markers and we have a telemetry to um, sync um, the LEDs to so we can turn them on and off. And we can get then tracks of the pigeon's flight trajectory in, in this calibrated volume through the, and we can see where the bird's flying, what it's it choose based on a particular uh, distribution of poles. So this is an example video. And you can see that they're actually quite maneuverable animals and they, they do hit poles. They, they don't always fly through without making, you know, hitting a pole. We've had pigeons crash on the floor. Uh, the poles do are lightweight so they don't, you know, injure themselves um, doing it. Um, let me show you an, another one, I think. I've got another one here. We've also gone from just focusing on maneuvering through the uh, pole array to looking at what are they doing as they approach it because we're interested in at what point do they actually try to make a change in flight trajectory that would give us an idea that they're actually doing some planning in advance of trying to navigate through the, uh, the poles. So this is the, the most recent uh, setup we had was we had the pigeon equipped with a backpack that now has IMUs on it uh, for acceleration and angular uh, rate gyros so we can try to measure head motion and body motion with a little video camera on the head. Um, so it's inspired by the goshawk video from the BBC um, and also that the UAVs are gonna have video cameras on them to measure op real-time optical flow. And I guess talking to Drew Bagnell, they've been doing that with the quad rotor here in the local parklands um, in guiding the quad rotors flight through a cluttered environment. And then the LEDs simplify tracking. So uh, YT's goal here is to get away from kinematics and be able to try to use uh, inertial uh, units, measurement units, to be able to try to calculate the, what the motions are without actually having to compute them from positional information. Uh, and so what we're able to do, and I'm going to just go through this, I'm happy to talk more at length after the seminar, but we, we can reconstruct the visual field because we know where the poles are relative to knowing where the position of the pigeon is through time, and I think you can all appreciate that the relative position in terms of depth near, near objects move faster. Uh, pigeons uh, and many birds have um, very broad uh, monocular fields. So the total panoramic vision of a pigeon is about 340 degrees. This is their blind spot back here, only 20 degrees. They have a very small binocular vision. So they don't really vi re rely on stereopsis to get depth perception. We think they rely on expansion and, and looming um, and opt relative op uh, measure of optical flow to get uh, relative depth perceptions. So here's the, here are the poles uh, as the pigeon's flying forward based on some particular random distribution in the bird's position, we can say, specify what's the angular position of the pole relative, you know, visual angle relative to where the bird is. This is, this is from a video frame from the video camera on the pigeon as it's approaching poles. Uh, clearly the pigeon can see some idea of, of the motion of the poles, so they can measure the rate of expansion, the loom in degrees per second. They can measure the absolute size increase, or phi. And these two parameters together um, represent a term uh, tau, which is phi over loom, 
which results in the time to contact. So when this goes to zero, you're in contact with the pole. Uh, and so uh, this has been one of the, gu the perceptual guidance cues we've been thinking that is important. And then the other is the angular flow uh, in the, of the obstacles as they move by as the bird passes, the angular velocity is the optical flow. So um, we can do these three things and, um, and, and try to test visual cues to detect obstacle distance and, and flight plan uh, for trajectory. And so this is an example path that the pigeon took. Here's its approaching, and this is the path it took through the, the flow field. We can then calculate, this is the phi, the angular size of these different, we can code them different colors. So these are the different obstacles as the pigeon passes by them. They get very large and they expand in their angular dimensions. And then they fade and go very small. The position in the angular flow field is, is here. So these are all potential perceptual cues we've been thinking might be used to, to, to guide the path planning through this, um, you know, through a particular um, trajectory. Uh, this is the loom, the rate of expansion. And so you can see the near side pole here expands very quickly and drops. And then the next pole expands and so on. And then the optical flow um, is timed as well. And so um, we're interested in where bird chooses to make maneuvers and where is it in this trajectory of these uh, visual detection cues. And so this is tau, the time to collision, which is the, the, uh, d the um, ratio of optic, of, of, sorry, the uh, Optical object size divided by um, the expansion rate. Um, and then we have, um, and we can look at, so YT has developed a model to try to come up with a way to guide this uh, path planning. Um, so that we've seen that. So here's our flight trajectory structures. These are the path trajectories that the pigeons took f for different paths through um, different pole positions. And we can track that through time. And one, what we've shown, one of the things we want are interested in is what if, what's the flight path trajectory the pigeons take when there's no poles versus when there are poles. And so with no poles, there's some variance here based on what, how the pigeon takes off left or right side of the takeoff perch. But in general, they're flying in a straight path with a fairly narrow, this is a 95% confidence interval and one standard deviation. I, no, this is the full range, sorry. This is the, the widest range we have for all trials. Through the obstacles, interestingly, the pigeons are still trying to fly straight. Overall average, even though they're moving back and forth, the average trajectory is straight, but there's much greater variance here laterally because they're trying to, they have to maneuver around obstacles. And we quantify this by the total bearing change. So they're actually having a maneuver further back and forth, side to side. Uh, they don't fly as straight, not surprisingly. They slow down. Um, relative to the forward uh, un unobstructed uh, flight speed. So they're having to slow down. So there's a penalty to how fast they can go through. There's probably increasing their power requirements for flight at a slower speed. Um, and they change their wing beat frequency characteristics. So there's some gross measures of flight performance costs associated with navigating through obstacles besides hitting them. Uh, one of the interesting things we found was that there's no evidence that the pigeons modulate their trajectory until about 1.5 meters before the pole array. So we think they're not really not doing long distance planning uh, based on perceptual cues at a distance. They're really reacting to cues at a much shorter uh, distance. Um, uh, we interestingly if, know that from neurobiologists that they've recorded two types of neurons, town neurons, which measure that ratio of optical um, uh, expansion relative to the rate of expansion or uh, time to collision. And they also have row sensitive neurons, which are measuring the rate of optical expansion here, um, represented there, whereas <clears throat> this would be the, um, the, the tau based neurons. And if we look at the distribution of, this, of the pole stimuli across the flight trials that uh, YT analyzed, it looks like tau seems to be the modal better predictor of what they're looking at. Uh, the rate, time to contact seems to be a more important parameter guiding the flight paths of the pigeons than the looming neurons um, that would suggest that they should be uh, operating the threshold is out in this range here, which they never really reach. So um, the, the guidance, um, and I don't really have time to, uh, and I don't completely, you know, so I, I don't have time to develop it, but we've developed a guidance model which basically has a, a, a cone, of, a vector, a cone of attention cone, plus or minus uh, 30 degrees either side, going at a depth of one and a half meters of paying attention to those poles. And the, 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 rule, the guidance rule is simply fly to the, uh, with that, whatever the, where the uh, poles are in position, guide, fly to the widest um, open space. And um, these are the experimental paths that the, the pigeons took. 
And these are our models based on that simple um, algorithm, that they simply fly to the widest gap based on uh, a, a given attention cone and where the, where the poles are. That guides the pigeon pretty well through. There's a little singularity here whether the pigeon's going to fly right or left. So it, in, the, in the real trial, it flew left. The model took it to the right path. So that's the one that deviated. So we think this is a pretty good start. It's a very simple model. Um, Drew Bagnell tells me that that's good if you know where the poles are, but the problem is that the UAVs have to process the visual cues from a camera, and that makes the, the problem much more hard to predict in advance. So I'm just going to show you the, uh, I've just got a couple more slides. This is the head cam of a pigeon flying through, um, I think I can plug this back in. I think I've got it. There we go. So you can see these are the head saccades of a pigeon, angular head saccades. That's Evo. So this will give you a sense of the experiment. And the pigeon's going to fly you through our, our fly area. Now is YT hiding off to the side there. So that's an experiment. We've, we've captured these video. We've given them this a uh, couple of the vision control people at MIT, but we're not sure whether this is going to help them solve the problem of vision control. Uh, I'll play it one more time because it's a kind of a fun video. Um, so we're not, for us, it's not all that useful. And we know the pigeon sees more than this, uh, but <coughs> this at least gives you a sense of what the experiment's like. And, uh, and one, it, was, it was hard, as you can imagine, this is a live animal experiment, getting the camera on the head, stabilizing it so there's not too much motion blur um, due to the, I mean, the pigeon's, it's a pretty frenetic, you know, kinetic energy, you know, oscillation of the bird with its wings moving up and down creates a lot of motion blur. Uh, so I just want to finish up with uh, just a couple of quick movies. This was a recent um, promotional video that Russ Tiedrich produced. So this is the UAV. This is a, sort of one of the early experiments that they ran at MIT. This is this downloadable from their site. And it's on a YouTube video. So this is the UAV flying through a whole spacing. <coughs> so. Some of you may know Russ, he, he has these probability funnels for, for developing a, a robust control. He didn't use this. They simply have motion capture where the plane is going and a, and a pretty well pre-planned flight path. So they, they're not yet implementing uh, actual you know, probability distributions for looking at the uh, control of the motion. But what I was excited about seeing this, where they're, and they actually are also doing horizontal uh, obstacles, which we're interested in looking at with the pigeons, and it, we've just focused on vertical obstacles. Um, so, my new postdoc on the project, YT went off to Genelia Farms, which is a big neurobiology research uh, center down at the Howard Hughes Center. Um, so Dave Williams joined the lab, and he's developed a, a pole array where we can control the spacing of the poles. And we've actually determined, the question was, how do, how do pigeons navigate through tight spaces? How do they squeeze through? And there's basically two strategies. Pigeons use either a, a, a wing paw strategy or a, 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 uh, or a fold back pattern. So on the left is the wing pause pattern. So they basically time the wing stroke cycles so that they hold the wings up and go through. This other s pattern, which I think it'll play again, is they, they, they fold the wings back at the, from the downstroke back up to the, you can see how they fold the wings back. One of the advantages of this is if the wing hits the, the obstacle, it doesn't cause damage. The feathers don't collide in a bad way. So we think it's a good strategy for avoiding damage. Uh, but it's, al it's also a pretty impressive strategy for simply navigating through a tight space. And we found that they can navigate through spaces that are about 13 centimeters wide. And their, their, their shoulder to shoulder width is about 10 centimeters. So they're going through spaces that are only three centimeter, one and a half centimeters clearance on either side of the body. And they're able to go through this. And so we've been looking at the strategies of different pole geometries. And um, talking to Chris, he came up with some good suggestions on how I might uh, do this experiment, whether the pigeons would actually prefer to go to the side where there's an open space versus a tighter space. Uh, by the way, this horizontal pole is simply holding the netting down because they will tend to fly over it if they're, if they're able to. They'll fly up against the netting and try to avoid that. So these are data that Dave is now analyzing because he's got active uh, LED markers and makes the kinematics more, more easy. So I think I'll finish with that. These are many of the people that have helped with the experiments over time. And uh, it's been a fun collaboration with the engineers to think about what are the problems of designing robots, whether they're auto, you know, autonomous air vehicles or robots that are running on the ground. 
and it helps guide us to do experiments we probably wouldn't otherwise do with animals. So thanks very much. Yeah? Do pigeons have an escape response when a hawk is coming at them? And wouldn't that then be the most important behavior they would have? which then they reuse in other situations? Well, pigeons, I know pigeons have been taken out of the air with, with local hawks. So I've, I have a colleague uh, who's actually past uh, postdoc, Jim Usherwood, was running, doing uh, GPS units that can use satellite tracking of pigeon position. They had a nature paper on flock flying behavior. And one of the problems when you've got these homing pigeons flying out, a hawk can come through and take out one of your pigeons. Um, in general, Smaller birds are high, more maneuverable than larger birds, smaller animals. Are, and so as pr potential prey, they're out in the aerial realm, they're able to outmaneuver the, the hawk. So the, if the pigeon sees the hawk, I think it's generally able to outmaneuver the hawk, although pigeons are pretty good sized birds, so it may not be small enough to actually get away from the hawk. But uh, I don't know what the escape strategy of the pigeon is. And the same question is, do they have a fovea or is there essentially uniform? They have two, they have two fovias. They have a, a forward looking fovea and a lateral fovea. So they do have visual acuity in the lateral uh, so monocular would, fields. Would that play an important role in uh, sort of visual guidance? Yep, yeah, right. So there's a, a, a Srinivasan from um, the University of Queensland has studied bumblebee flight and recently parrot flight. And you know about he flies them down these runways, uh, flyways with variable spacing on the walls and very nicely shows that if you put the spaces close, that increases the optical flow on one side and they'll, they'll fly away and that'll move them over to the close wall. So they balance optical flow in both lateral sides. So they'll, so we think the lateral flow is very important in guiding where they choose to go. Yeah, and we think birds probably do the same thing with the insects as well, uh, you know, bumblebees as well as probably parrots. Yeah? So the pigeons don't seem to modulate their forward velocity. They, they slow down. They go from about, if it's free open flight, they get up to about six and a half meters a second between the perches. And they go down, they slow down about four meters a second, four and a half meters a second. But I mean, it, you, you would think at some density of obstacles, they would have to slow down a lot, but then that makes them less maneuverable. Yep. Right, so one of, we think that the, this fold back and wing pause, well, we're interested in, we think that the wing pause pattern is, uh, gives them the ability, they're in a position to produce the, the large aerodynamic force and power required for this to, re con, con, you know, it, regain control of their flight path trajectory. And so uh, we think that's going to be likely, they'll be more maneuverable. And so we actually have done an experiment where we've had that array and we've now put obstacles behind it. So if they do the fold back, we think they're going to be less able to maneuver and, and there will be either more collisions or less turning performance to avoid collisions. And so we're looking at that currently right now as a trade-off in one strategy versus the other. But um, we're trying to come up with, we've agreed that one of the cost functions is, is is what, how much energy does it take to, f to fly through uh, this space? And so you could think of it in terms of time and flight speed, but it's also cost. And so, you know, costs are going to be overall potential and kinetic energy fluctuations of ba those costs, but also we can come up with an aeronautic model where a U shaped power curve would, if they slow down, that's in increasing their induced power requirement. So we can look at that cost component too. Yeah. Yep. So as you pointed out, you have home take phobia in the pigeons, yep. and on the ground they have a saccadic movement and turning in air. What about the birds that have linear phobia? Do you predict that they have a different control strategy, or rather that they only do flow fields and don't? Because there are birds on the ground that don't show the saccades, and they have a very different fly structure. Do you think it's a different control structure as well? You know, I, you know I, that's, a, that's a good question. I, you know, I, I think, I think that the lateral fovea is really, you tend to see these lateral, you know, so the birds of prey, the hawks and the eagles and the falcons have a increased binocular vision because they're the animals trying to have better depth perception and being able to track a, a target. Uh, whereas the other, you know, birds, the birds of potentially the prey species have these, you know, they've sort of been selected for being able to see predators in their lateral and have these. I understand that. Yeah. The idea is the stabilized head should give you relative motion to your stabilized platform. Right. But the question is for if you have a linear phobia, is that because you're mainly doing flow? And that's, it's very common in water, waterfowl, for instance, which don't have that right. pump take movement. And maybe they do flow more than they do the stabilized platform. Yep. Yep. 
I think you're probably right. I mean, I, in general, you know, like waterfowl or heavy wing loaded birds, they tend to fly fast. They're generally flying in very open air flow fields where, you know, flying over water. Obstacles are not, a, not an issue for them. And so it's a very, you know, linear uh, trajectories and, and, and looking at angular flow, you know, whether it's the ground based flow in terms of coming in for landing or, you know, lateral flow if there is a predator coming in would be the things that they'd be looking at. But that's, a, that's a good question. I, we, we, we can fly mallard ducks through something like this. I've never gotten a duck to fly in the wind tunnel, but it would be interesting to have them see how they, whether they just, they may just crash right through the obstacles because they don't, this they, is. They just fly with ping pong yeah, well I, well, I was surprised we get the pigeons to fly through this because pigeons are, they're called rock doves. They tend to be cliff dwelling. That's why they do so well in our urban environments. You know, they're not a forest spe dwelling species that, you know, you get uh, some morning doves that'll fly, you know, I see in the woods, but, um, you know, you know they're not, the goshawk that I showed in the beginning, that, that's really a, a, a predatory bird that actually will fly in the brush and track down. So they're very, they've been, you know, evolved to really pursue prey through very cluttered environments. So that's why it'd be great to get a, and see whether the hawks use different visual cues uh, as a predator rather than the prey species. So, but that's, a, I think changes in phobia structure would be really interesting to look at. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's going to guide the UAV control problem though, so. Yeah. So you seem to have been captured by a particular philosophical viewpoint, ecological psychology, where you map directly from things you can easily measure in the image, like optical flow, to behavior. Interestingly enough, the Robox Institute contains a lot of people who, who basically oppose that viewpoint. And instead, you build a 3D model of the world, and you plan how to get through the poles. Yeah. Do you? You know, what is the evidence that these pigeons have no cognition, have no intellectual <laughs> life? Well, we're, we're trying to understand whether they, you know, what kind of learning and, and cognition goes on in terms of path planning. Um, but we've seen they will, if you keep the same pole structure up with a given distribution, they will, as they, as they fly, we do repeat of flight trials, like 15 trials through a given pole array they do develop a preferred flight path. And if they came back to it, you swapped uh, sort of situations? Do they recognize a prior situation? That's, these are all good questions. No, we don't know the answer to that. If that were true, wouldn't that be compelling evidence that sort of directly mapping from the variables you talked about to action was the wrong way to go? Well, I, I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I mean, you would have to worry about the, the fact that there is some cognitive plan in place that that may be over, overlaying the, the immediate proximity cues. Uh, so maybe we're over giving too much importance to proximity uh, reaction cues. The pigeon's only planning at a very short interval of time and reacting to the initial the proximate cues in front of it. Uh, from the point of view of guiding UAV flight where you've got um, motion detectors being your video cameras on the, the fixed wing aircraft, you know, it's, 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 the problem is how do you perceive that process that information and, and provide a control algorithm in real time that avoids the, the obstacle or navigates the path. And I, I, so I think proximity and rapid processing of proximity cues is one way to simplify the problem. If, if there's cognition and a, and a brain going on, the UAV is not going to be able to well, do that in real time. Should a UAV have an intellectual life? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, well, you, you guys are smarter than us, so I, I don't know. You know, you, and you got bigger computers, so you can map out the much more higher dimensional space of uh, things in the environment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I look at your your robot, and that's 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 a that's a very complex uh, smart robot. Yeah, it doesn't fly through trees. I no, I'm that. sure it doesn't. I'm sure it doesn't. But it's a smart. It's a well, you know, pigeons have demonstrated amazing feats. Well, they're. You know, they're not the smartest bird, let me put it that way. Based on having worked with birds, parrots are much smarter, starlings, you know, crows, corvids are very smart birds. Um, and, and we know that crows learn and in their, their motor learning skills are remarkable. And puzzle solving for being able to get it, food rewards, it really impresses. So it would be nice to fly a, a corvid through and see what a smart bird would do relative to a dumb pigeon. But <laughs> pigeons, pigeons are docile animals, easy to handle. You know, a crow would be a very hard animal to work with, so we, we start off with the easy uh, species first. So we, maybe we've dummied them down more than they, they deserve, I don't, I don't know. But we were surprised, we thought that we'd see, but, but there are a lot of directions we need to go in terms of looking at 
learning and decision making that I think we can sort of get. One of the problems we have, so Emilio Bisi is one of the people in it. He would like us to use a Poisson's distribution where we go from one poll up out of our, our, I don't know, we have 18 polls in the array and have a completely randomized distribution of polls and the position and number of polls. And the problem is these are, you know, we run, run maybe 85 to 100 tri flight trials. That's one way. We have to fly the pigeons back. And that takes about three to four hours to do. The pigeons get tired. We get tired. It's not like running computer simulations where you can do fully <laughs> plus on distribution to look at navigation uh, goals. So there are practical constraints working with the animals. Yeah. OK. Is there are no further questions. Let's thank the speaker again.